Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are approaching the mid-term portion of uh, our BAMP series on philosophy of nature uh, in the modern age. Uh, today, I'm very happy uh, to welcome Ryan Fluster uh, from the Catholic University of Louvain. Uh, Ryan will present uh, a paper on two aspects of nature in Spinoza's metaphysics. Um, and without further ado, please take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm very excited. Uh, and what I'm wanting to talk about today, or what I'm presenting today, um, is really a part of a paper, or maybe it will have to be a larger project. A larger project. It's it's in progress, um, and I'm having to kind of narrow the scope of what what I'm presenting due to time constraints, but I think I can explain sort of the basic framework that I'm trying to articulate. And what my goal is, is to try to advance an interpretation of Spinoza's notion of essence, which allows for a more strongly monistic picture of his ontology. So basically I'm trying to figure out how to think through uh, Spinoza's metaphysical system in a way that avoids Platonism. I think it's very easy to take all of the oppositions, all of the opposing principles in Spinoza's metaphysics and come up with a picture in which one side of the opposition is somehow derivative from the other. So examples are eternity versus duration, action versus passion, uh, the infinite versus the finite, the necessary versus the contingent. It's hard to avoid looking at Spinoza's system which is so thoroughly structured in accordance with all of these oppositions and avoid an interpretation in which the latter side, the finite, the contingent, the, uh, the passive, um, is not somehow merely a kind of lower form, an image, um, a derivation of the former side uh, of the infinite, of the active, et cetera. Or alternatively, you could advance a kind of de deflationary or reductivist interpretation and say that the, the former terms, the infinite, the active, um, are only sort of conceptual means of relating the latter terms or are epiphenomenal to the latter terms. So I want to avoid this sort of prioritizing of one side of these oppositions to the other. And so to avoid this, I wanted to come up with a reading of Spinozistic essence, which would take the two sides of these oppositions as being mutually necessary. So I take essence for Spinoza as something fundamentally relational, something which is always constituted through the connection between two distinct essential terms. And through this connection can be said to exist. And so to show what I mean by this, I sort of need to, I need to start with an account of existence. And in Spinoza's philosophy, we don't ever get existence unto itself as a mere given. Existence is always existence in virtue of something. And we find the most concise formulation of this in uh, Proposition 11 of Book 1, the second proof of that proposition. So for every cause, uh, sorry, for every thing, a cause or reason must be assigned either for its existence or, or its non-existence. For example, if a triangle exists, there must be a reason or cause for its existence. If it does not exist, there must be a reason or cause which prevents it from existing or which annuls its existence. So here we have something uh, very crucial for Spinoza and very unique because it's not only that something has to have a cause for its, for its existence, but also for its non-existence. So there's no neutral default of either existing, um, some kind of like existing material stuff like prime matter or a default of existence as a kind of empty void that needs to be filled, that uh, has to have something um, cause something, uh, enter, uh, cause something to enter into it. Instead, what we get, is that particular existence, whatever its status, 
uh, is something which has to be accounted for. Accounted for in terms of what? In terms of essence. So we can therefore say that existence is that which is related to essence, which is accounted for in terms of essence. Whether we think in terms of active and passive or eternal and durational or necessary and contingent, all of these represent ways that existence uh, can be seen as shaped, as determined in a particular way through different essences which oppose one another in accordance with one of these, pre which one of the, sorry, with one of the previously mentioned dichotomies. So if existence for Spinoza is always something which must be organized with respect to itself or, or related to itself, in order to talk about essence, we need to talk about that, how that relation takes place. Uh, what then is sort of the, the basis for all of these opposing schema? What is underlying activity and passivity, eternity and duration, et cetera? And this relation or this sort of formula for relations in general, I locate in uh, Proposition 29 of Book One, the Scolium, in which Spinoza talks about the relation between natu natura naturans and natura naturata. He says, by natura naturans, we must understand that which is in itself and conceived through itself, that is the attributes of substance that express eternal and infinite essence or God insofar as he is considered a free cause. And by natura naturata, I understand all that flows from the necessity of God's nature, that is from the necessity of each one of God's attributes or all of the modes of God's attributes insofar as they are considered as things which are in God and can neither be nor be conceived without God. So here we have this very basic dichotomy uh, between different aspects of God as nature naturing, natura naturans, and nature natured, natura naturata. And it's these terms which constitute the way that nature relates to itself. So any existing thing is what it is because it represents a certain relationship between nature as determining and nature as determined by itself. And I think what's really important about this for Spinoza, or at least what I wanna focus on, um, is that we always require two terms, natura naturans and natura naturata, which means that for Spinoza, uh, nothing is simply what it is. Uh, nothing is intrinsically itself. Unlike, for example, Aristotle. So Aristotelian essence, uh, this is from Aristotle's Metaphysics Book One. He says, the essence of each thing is that which it is, uh, which it is said to be per se. So, for Aristotle, essence is a thing's intrinsic qualities, what something is, not in virtue of other essences, but in virtue of itself. And I give the example of a cultured man. A cultured man is not essentially cultured because culture is another essence distinct from that of man. And another important thing about uh, the Aristotelian notion of essence is that, as he says, the formula of the essence of each thing is what determine, sorry, is what defines a term, but does not contain it. So essence does not contain a thing for Aristotle. It's a quality which defines a thing, but it doesn't inherently posit it or denote it. Uh, for example, a white surface and a flat surface represent two distinct essences, but they may be uh, referring to the same thing with a piece of paper, which means, that different essences can be about the same thing without, um, without necessarily positing that thing. They don't have to, the essences don't have to entail the thing. So those are really, uh, those are two very important differences from Spinoza. Uh, one is that um, if we return to the, the, the naturans, naturata formulation, uh, one important difference is that for Spinoza, essences are, are bound by a kind of necessity. 
unlike Aristotle, where the essence defines but does not contain the thing, for us, for Spinoza, essences bring things about. They're more like protocols or procedures for constituting a thing. They don't have uh, essences, they don't have a content independent of the process of bringing about um, of bringing about that which they represent. So again, we see this, this necessary connection between an essence and a thing, a determination. Essences are the means of constituting things. And a consequence of that fundamentally dynamic conception of essence for Spinoza is that we don't get the kind of intrinsic self-identity, the per se essence that we see in Aristotle. Instead, we always have naturans and naturata, with a thing's essence um, only being constituted as the relationship between naturans and naturata. So a thing's self-identity is always not only what it is, it's the way that one intrinsic quality can be related to or thought of in terms of what it is not, what is essentially distinct from it. So these two aspects of the thing's essence are mutually necessary. We don't ever have uh, naturata as simply derived from or produced by naturans. Instead, both terms are always co-present. They're mutually necessary terms whose relation represents the bringing about of the thing. So, so what it means for a particular thing to exist is for naturata to be determined by naturans or for some thing, some nature to determine some other thing, some other nature. And at the same time, it's the way that naturata manifests naturans, the way that one essence instantiates or enacts that determinative influence of another essence. So naturans and naturata constitute an essence through a kind of circular relation, one in virtue of the other. Existence then is that which is mediated by or determined through this relationship. We wouldn't attribute existence to one side and not the other. For example, by saying that essence is related to active determining nature, nature uh, natura naturans, and existence is that which is affected or determined. Uh, naturata. Instead, existence is structured through the mutual restriction, the push and pull of naturans and naturata. Why? Because all things for Spinoza exist in other things, through other things, in relation to other things. So we can understand that existence as a kind of negotiated structure consisting of two terms, a structured relation between the way that, natu that, sorry, that naturata exists as influenced by naturans and the way that naturans has its existence enacted through naturata. And depending on the terms that we choose for naturans and naturata, we have a different existing thing which is selected, or to put it another way, we can see how existence is determined or constituted in a particular way through the relationship between these different essential terms. So, so how does this very abstract relationship that I've just described actually function? Uh, how do we think about a particular essence as existing through a relationship to some other essence? Well, if we look at the two sides, naturans and naturata, we see that there are two distinct relationships which connect one side to the other. In the yellow, we see that naturans is God insofar as he expresses essence, so the attributes of substance that express eternal and infinite essence. Um, and, we, uh, and we see naturata is what follows from that essence. So that all that follows from the necessity of God's nature, that is from the necessity of each one of God's attributes. So that's one way that we can say that nature relates to itself. One way in which it is one way in which it natures and is natured. 
But another way is based on um, involvement, based on that nature in itself. So that is naturans as what we must understand as that which is in itself and conceived through itself, and naturata as all of the modes of God's attributes insofar as they are considered as things which are in God and can neither be nor be conceived without God. <clears throat> so we have this very basic, fundamentally relational ontological principle, naturans and naturata which has these two aspects, these two different kinds of essential relations uh, by which existence is determined. So to make this hopefully a little bit more concrete, we can turn from the level of naturans and naturata itself, the sort of ultimate uh, essentially abstract relationship. Um, and we can look at how this idea operates at the level of finite essence. So, this is in um, the second definition of book two. Spinoza says, I say that there pertains to the essence of a thing, that which when granted the thing is necessarily posited and by the annulling of which the thing is necessarily annulled, or that without which the thing can neither be nor be conceived and vice versa, that which cannot be or be conceived without the thing. So here we're given two separate ways of conceptualizing how essence brings about things. Essence is on the one hand expression a positing of something and a corresponding resulting from or being an effect of something. And on the other hand, essence is that through which a thing exists or is conceived of. And correspondingly, it is that it is at the same time that which is only itself conceived of as involving that thing. So one, one crucial difference um, from what I was just talking about, the, the very general level of naturans and naturata itself uh we to say that for finite things the naturans and the naturata terms are never the same essence so when we talk about finite involvement and finite expression we're talking about the mutual relation between two distinct essences and how existence is determined in virtue of that relation so back to involvement and expression my basic point is that these two definitions represent different aspects of the same essential relationship. That is, different ways of articulating the way that existence is determined in virtue of essence, or different ways of thinking about the connection, the relation between naturans and naturata. So now I want to take a closer look at these two different aspects of essential relation. Um, and try to explain how they function in a, in a little bit more concrete of a way. So beginning with expression. Um, the way I interpret expression is as a relationship which revolves around commonality or qualitative coincidence between distinct essences. So this is an idea that uh, Andrea Sangiacomo explains very well in his recent book, Spinoza on Reason, Passions, and the Supreme Good. So I'll use his explanation as sort of a starting point for my own interpretation. Um, so Sangiacomo says in his book, singular things have essences. They, these essences do not entail existence and they do not always exist in time and place, but they are instantiated only in a finite segment of the infinite chain of causes. When an essence exists in act or is given, it exists as a striving to bring about certain effects. In fact, God's essence is nothing but its power, and finite things express in finite ways God's own substance, that is, God's own essence. It follows that finite things are finite expressions of God's own power. In other words, finite things are essentially defined by what they can bring about. Insofar as a thing exists, its existence is nothing but a striving or kanatus to bring about certain effects. So this description of essence is clearly related to what I've described as this, the expressionistic side, um, as opposed to the involvement side. We're talking about essence in terms of a bringing about of effects. So what does it really mean to bring about effects? Remember that we're trying to, when we're, um, 
what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to take a particular existing situation, a particular field of existence, let's say, and account for it in terms of the relationship between an expressive essence and a resulting or following essence. So how do we organize or account for that existence in terms of some, of, of some essential relationship like this? We do it in terms of how the essences of different things interact with each other or to what extent they coincide or agree with each other. So we have, we have a set of particular essences or kanatus, as in the plural kanatus, kanatus is. Um, and uh, reading from San Giacomo again, he says, the thing's kanatus is nothing but the actual essence and expresses the fact that the thing actually exists. As such, the thing's kanatus does not admit degrees because insofar as it exists, the thing always and constantly strives to persevere in its own being, which being nothing but the thing's essence does not admit changes. So on the one hand, we have within this field of existence, something which is purely self-identical or self-coincident, a self-relation, and that's the kanatus, because the kanatus is nothing more than self-affirmation, nothing more than a striving, which constitutes a thing's power to exist. So it's fully distinct from anything else that exists. It's qualitatively separate. It does not admit of degrees. But on the other hand, we have the power of the Kanatsus, the way that it determines existence or its expressiveness. This San Giacomo describes as um, the power of acting. He says, since the power of acting expresses at each moment the efficacy with which the thing's kanatus is successful in instantiating the thing's essence into existence, the thing's power of acting does admit degrees. And in fact, the thing's power of acting constantly increases or decreases depending on the outcomes of its interactions with external causes. So the power of expressiveness, um, the power of express the, the power of a kanatus's expressiveness does admit of degrees because it's a function of multiple essences. It's a function of the kanatus within a particular field of existence. So how then do these things work together to express existence? It says whether and to what extent the individuals striving to bring about its own effects will be successful depends on the causal network in which the individual operates, depending on their natures of agreement and disagreement in nature with the individual. External causes can hinder the production of certain effects and support that of other effects. So <clears throat> we can say that a particular finite essence is more or less expressive depending on how much influence it exerts. And that this degree of influence is a function of how much it agrees with the other essences that it interacts with. So each of these essences expresses themselves and the actual power that they exert, the actual effect that they have, depends on how much those expressions coincide. It, it depends on to what extent they are all expressing something in common as opposed to expressing something that con conflicts with each other, with one another. So the actual expressive determination is therefore, from the perspective of, of natura naturans, a function of the essential coincidence between these essences, the degree to which they determine existence in a common way. What then is the result or the effect of this determination? So here I go beyond San Giacomo's analysis a little bit because I, I want to bring in the influence of Naturato. We can't think of expression just in terms of how things can be said to follow from one or more essences because expression isn't just the force by which Naturans determines Naturata, it's also about what's expressed, what actually results. So we have to think about this field of, uh, uh, this field of existence insofar as it is the result of some expression, an effect which has come about. And this result is something constituting a distinct essence, something which is irreducible to any of the essences whose, whose coincidence produced it, 
but which manifests the power of all of these essences. This manifestation, this new distinct essence is that power. It is the existence of that power, the way in which that power has reality or represents a real determination of being as opposed to being power taken in this sort of abstract sense, which would be a kind of occult quality. So, so here's an example of how these two sides, these Naturans and Naturata side, relate to the constitution of a particular existence. So take the physical human body. The physical human body is a field of existence, which is the result of the human essence or kanatus, as well as the essences of other things of which the body is composed. For example, the organic compounds which compose our skin and blood. Insofar as those essences coincide with the human kanatus, we can say that they bring about a field of existence, the body, which is to a large degree the expression of the human kanatus. We can understand um, what the body does, how it exists. We can understand those things very well if we understand it as an expression of an essential striving to exist by a human essence. Um, but we can also understand the body in other ways, for example, as a system of chemical processes or as a kind of thermal system or an electrochemical system or an atomic system. On this level, we would describe, on these levels, uh, we would describe it, well, let's say on the level of, a, of a chemical processes. We would describe the body as the expression of different chemical natures, which coincide in some ways and disagree in others uh, to constitute this particular, um, this particular existence. And we can account for the existence of the body in terms of chemical expression, but it's much less direct uh, than accounting for it in terms of the kanatus. We have to include many more essences many more chemical natures which interact in many more ways to account for this field of existence in terms of chemical expression. But the fact that we can understand the body in other ways like that is a consequence of the fact that the body is not reducible to the expression of the kanatus, but instead results from the coincidence of that expression with the expression of atoms, molecules, cells, electrical currents, organs, all of these other things which have particular effects following from them. So, so as a consequence of this, um, as a consequence of this, this confluence of different expressive uh, powers, we would say that the body is a thing, an essence in its own right. It's a distinct essence consisting of a kanatus and a power of influence unto itself because all of the things whose expression contribute to producing it, with the exception of God, um, all of these things are finite. So there's no single expressive essence which fully accounts for the body. Um, it is what it is as a result of several essences. And so the body is irreducible to any one of them. However, uh, it's only through this newly constituted distinct essence of the body that the human kanatus is actually expressed, is actually able to manifest, to determine reality, to enter into relations with other essences. So the power of the human kanatus, uh, which is the Naturan's term determining the body, is therefore only something real, something actually determining existence insofar as the body, the Naturata term, is an essence in its own right because it's only by presupposing that the distinct essence of the, uh, sorry, by presupposing that there is a distinct essence of the body that we can say that the kanatus enacts influence on things which are not essentially identical to it. That is to say that it exerts some impact on things outside of it, that it has a real, ex uh, a real existence. That is insofar as the essence of the body constitutes its own expressive relationship. Insofar as the body does things, um, um, it can be seen as something which uh, determines existence in its own right. Um, for example, 
by the body consuming nutrients, performing actions, typing on a keyboard, kissing a baby, etc. So the particular the particular field of existence, which includes the body and the body's activities, exists as the relation between the human kanatus as a determining force and the distinct essence of the body, which is on the one hand uh, what manifests the kanatus, but only while also being something in its own right, with its own existence irreducible to that kanatus. So when we take these as the two terms of the naturans and naturata relation, we get an explanation of the physical activities of the body as the expression of a human essence. When the body eats and laughs and heals, uh, heals itself and sings, we're able to say that those activities, those determinations of the world, that all of those are the expression of a singular human essence. The power of the human essence is the degree to which that particular relationship between kanatus and body is explanatory of the field of existence that we're, that we're thinking about. So in the case of the human kanatus and the human body, we have a very robust relationship between naturans and naturata. We can account for almost everything that we associate with human beings through this relationship. So we have a very high degree of expression, a very large range of existence, which we can say follows from the kanatus and also manifests the kanatus. So expression on the finite level um, is this way of existing in relation to other essences, where you have an essence, a power which results in certain effects, which you wouldn't see in the same way if that essence wasn't a determining factor. But that power of influence is always acting, existing through something which is different from it, different nature, a power in its own right. Finite, finite expression is how things exist amidst this infinity of different powers and resulting effects. It's a way of navigating among these essences and grouping them together, relating them to one another by finding a singular coincident relation which they all express. So, um, so that's expression. So if expression allows us to divvy up or determine existence in virtue of how it follows from essence, how can we say that involvement works? So a reading that, um, a reading that I found, which I think provides a good sort of basis for understanding involvement or what I mean by involvement at least, is that of Jonathan Bennett's with his, uh, his field metaphysical concepts. And here I'm gonna present a explanation of Bennett's concept by Valtteri Vilyanin in his 2007 article entitled Field Metaphysic Power and Individuation in Spinoza. So this explanation for existence, um, this, is, this is an explanation for existence in terms of a conceptual relationship. So I remember that I said that, uh, that involvement is about some essence without which the thing can neither be nor be conceived and vice versa, which cannot be or be conceived without the thing. So Bennett gives the example of the relationship between space in general and the finite regions of space which constitute particular things within it. So in this first quote, he says, this is, uh, this is um, Billion and quoting Bennett. Bennett says, the thought of a whole space is not built up out of thoughts of its subregions, whereas the thought of any finite region of space must involve the thought of a larger region or the, or the whole of space within which it is embedded. So as Bennett says here, um, the essence of a particular spatial thing can't be conceived um, can't be conceived of except with reference to space as a totality, because that thing, the chair or body or surface, is a determination or modification of the whole field of space within which it exists. And I should note, uh, I should note briefly that. Um, what, we're, what, what, what this example could be referring to within Spinoza's uh, system, because since we're talking about the field of space as something which can be divided, we can't be thinking of the attribute of extension, since attributes are conceivable per se, as Spinoza says in Proposition 10, and therefore attributes are indivisible. 
So the example here of a field of space would have to be about the infinite mode of extension, something which encompasses all, extend, all, all extended things, but can also be taken as divided or determined in virtue of those things. So um, continuing on, and this is, this is Vilyan and now, uh, the regions of the whole space can become many different kinds of quality in such a way that statements about material bodies can be reduced to statements about space. More exactly, each particular body must be associated with a spa spatio-temporally continuous string of place times. The central idea is that bodily objects must be logical constructions out of strings of place times, where Spinoza's basic ontology does not contain physical objects. According to Bennett, this makes bodies adjectival to regions of space. All statements about bodies can at least in principle be expressed in terms of how space is. So, <clears throat> on this reading, existence, specifically spatial existence, is a singular thing, a field, which is divided through particular strings of place times, as, uh, as Liliana characterizes them. And these strings of place times constitute what we think of as particular spatial bodies. But these bodies necessarily refer to the underlying field of space in order to be conceived because they exist as determinations of that field. So we can think of this again with the example of the human body. The human body under this spatial involvement paradigm would be a field of spatial existence unto itself. In one sense, it represents the composition or modification of a certain spatial background, like the spatial field of molecules, which are organized in a particular way. These would themselves be the modification of a certain background, the atomic field, being determined in a particular way to constitute molecules. So the body would be a kind of, a kind of layer of spatial organization, a particular self-relationship of space, specifically the self-relationship of cells or organs or whatever level of spatial granularity you want to think of the body in terms of. So what we have is this kind of shifting relationship between two spatial essences, one of which constitutes the background, which is the, the principle or the ground which is being determined, and the other representing the foreground, the particular thing which is determined in virtue of the principle um, or as a modification of it. And we can take that kind, of, uh, that kind of relational structure and use it to conceive of things which exist at various levels with one essence conceived in terms of the existence of a more general essence, or as Spinoza would say, existing in something. But, but again, I would want to take this one step further and talk about naturata and say that the foreground layer not only involves the background layer, but vice versa. And the reason I say that is because we don't have something like a field of space which exists in abstraction from its determinations. We don't have, in most cases, atoms which exist without also constituting molecules, nor do we have molecules, at least in the human body, which exist without also constituting cells in most, in most cases. We have, as a whole, not a field of space, but a spatial reality, which is the totality of all existing spatial things, each of which is conceivable in terms of another more general level of spatial thing. So to think about a field of spatial existence in terms of involvement, we have to think about the essence of the background or principle as involving the essence of the foreground, of there being a, a mutual relationship between these two levels. And I think, the best way to think about that relationship is not in terms of separate spatial fields or layers, um, but as a particular system which exists on one level as a singular simple thing, a kind of a, a pattern which maintains itself and, be, and can be understood in virtue of itself. So for example, again, the body is a spatial system which you can understand as a particular spatial pattern, a pattern of organization namely an organic self-regulating pattern. And all of the different functional functioning mechanisms within the body can be conceived partially at least in virtue of that organic principle, that pattern. 
the natures belonging to these functions within the body, a particular organ or organ system or cell, supervene upon that organic principle because the principle represents the way in which all of those um, organs, for example, uh, the way that they all act in some kind of unison in terms of that organic principle. So the organic principle is a concept or essence by which the parts are all embraced as comprising a whole system, a singular pattern. So to conceive of the essence of these elements, you would need to do so, sorry, to conceive of the essence of the, the organs, to, to continue my example, you would need to do so in terms of the organized system, which they all participate in. Since the body is a finite thing, you would need to conceive of other things besides, uh, besides that organic principle as well. Since, these, uh, since the functions of the organs are spatially determined in virtue of other principles as well, like those governing chemical behavior, cellular uh, activity, or physical properties. But the organic movement of the body could roughly be thought of as a systemic principle of organization, which the elements of the body can be conceived through. The organic principle would be, to quote Spinoza, that without which the things, the organs, the physical functions, etc., um, could neither be nor be conceived. So that would be that would be the naturalist side. However, this principle, the organic of uh, the organic self-organization of the body does not exist apart from the elements of the system which it governs. It is something, this principle is something which arises from the elements moving in concert. The organic rhythm of the body is the totality of the movements of the organs or the cells or the atoms. This is the other side of the involvement formulation. The body's principle its spatial essence as organic movement is that which, to quote Spinoza again, can neither be nor be conceived without the things, the or without the organs, without the lower functions. So when we talk about existence as determined um, in terms of involvement, that is what we mean, a mutual relationship between two essentially distinct things, like the body as a whole and the organs, which nonetheless are conceived of in relation to one another to constitute a particular system of existential organization. So the organic movement of the body is the systemic principle by which all of the constituent organs can be seen as elements of a larger whole, and the organs are the elements through which that organic whole operates or exists as a body. So when we talk about the body as a particular essence, a self-relation in terms of involvement, we're talking about how a more global order of organization, um, a system, is constituted through elements which are themselves partially distinct from that order. That is, uh, which, represents es which, rep which represent essences or systemic orders unto themselves in some way but which are also partially conceivable in terms of how they manifest that unified system amongst themselves. <clears throat> so involvement organizes existence in this way, again, through a circular form of definition where one thing acts as the principle, what, the, what things are conceived in, and the other acts as the elements, that without which the principle cannot be or be conceived. Different things can be differentiated in virtue of what essences are involved in this circular relation. The organic body is primarily conceivable as a system of organs, but because it is finite, it also involves essences which are not conceivable through that organic principle. The organic essence is therefore fragile. It has to exist as the determination of non-organic essences, systems which can't be conceived through it, but which have their own principles and so move in their own ways with the global order or principle um, representing the life of the body therefore being subject to disruption as these systems cease to move in concert. So, and the, the finitude of the body also means that we get different degrees of involvement depending on the terms that we are, uh, we're using. So obviously the body is composed of quarks, but the dynamics by which quarks form a spatial organization 
do not tell us much about human bodies as organic systems. So there's comparatively less involvement between organic life as a spatial principle and quarks as their constituent elements. The naturans of a body's organic movement has very little involvement with the naturata of quark interactions. And, although, and so although the body involves quarks, the system of quarks does not allow us to see much of anything organic as its organizing principle. <clears throat> so again, it's circular. The naturans term and the naturata term constitute a certain relation between essences. And depending on which essence we choose as the terms of this relation, we have different ways of conceiving existence. We could conceive it as an organic body, a cloud of atoms, a group of dancers, a driver operating a machine, etc. So to conclude, I've, um, I've decomposed essential determinations into these different types of relation. One of expression, how existence can be seen as following from particular essences, and one of involvement, which is how existence can be seen as organized through particular essences. But why have both expression and involvement? Why are both of these um, versions of essential relation uh, present in Spinoza's system? Are they simply alternative but equivalent versions of the same thing? I think what having both expression and involvement allows Spinoza to do is to explain two fundamental aspects of reality, which is its productivity and its intelligibility. Because, because an aspect of every existing thing is its essential ability to do things, to act and to be affected, to bring about effects, we say that its essence is expressive. And because an aspect of every existing thing is also its being knowable, it's existing necessarily in terms of some order, we say that its essence has involvement. So that's it. Thank you guys for listening. <clears throat> I apologize uh, for whatever reason. I started coughing the second you were concluding. Um, um, so I would ask you to stop sharing the screen so that we can uh, have a beautiful mosaic of everyone in attendance. And uh, I would invite every, everyone who feels comfortable doing so uh, to turn on their cameras as we begin the conversational part. Um, so thank you so much for this. Uh, this was a very challenging and I'm sure very thought provoking uh, session. I'm sure you will have uh, a lot of uh, questions. And so I, I will ask all of you uh, to try and keep it short because I can see this becoming um, a very, uh, very beautiful conversation. Uh, so just, uh, you can either use the raise hand function or you can pop in the chat. All right, let's start with Friedrich. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I I received this as a very interesting presentation of uh, essential point in Spinoza's metaphysics. Um, let me say, uh, okay, the first which is, seems important to me is that you stress that essence is a relation, is the, as if I understand right, is the necessitating relation between say substance and mode or what in the sense. Um, the second, um, the only um, interest uh, by agreeing fully in this, from my point of view or for, for my interest, research interest of view would be how to get a kind of logical picture, a logical construct, construct, construct picturing this necessity relations to some extent. But of course, uh, it's not easy to have, but this was one interest. Um, my second point, uh, excuse me. Yes, uh, second point also in my view, very important that one should not prioritize one of Spinoza's pairs. Not uh, causa sui against uh, in alio as a, 
and what whatever, because this was contradict the monistic account in principle. So both fully agree. Um, okay, and my last, perhaps I did not get the point really, but I would hesitate only in your uh, sketch uh, uh, relating to the Villian foil uh, between involvement and Spinoza's concept of space, but only because Spinoza's concept of space is a very difficult thing in itself. Uh, I, yesterday, uh, we had a discussion at the University of Bucharest, Newton's bucket experiment, absolute space and so on. And if you contrast this with Descartes, and especially Spinoza's account of space, that's a jungle. So I hesitate to follow the in uh, details there. But thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the, the question about space, I kind of, I made that little note about the attribute versus infinite mode because um, initially this, this idea came to me because I was trying to write a paper about how uh, infinite modes relate to attributes. And so this question of, of space um, was very much on my mind and that's still a project that I want to take on. And, and a big part of that is like you said, this question of, uh, space for Spinoza is not something static or, um, or uh, simply given. So trying to account for the infinite modes in terms of what they express, what does an infinite mode express uh, is, is sort of another part of this, um, this larger inquiry that I was, that I was uh, trying to engage on. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, Edith and then uh, Dan. Edith, you're muted. Oh, and Ryan, if I could ask you uh, while you listen to the questions to shut your mic because otherwise it creates a return. Oh, yes. Yeah, I know it was terrible. Um, I, first of all, thank you. <laughs> Definitely rich but challenging paper. The first thing I want to um, may, I want to make a couple of comments and then ask a question. Um, well, the comments and the question do come together in some ways, but first of all, I'd be very careful in terms of any kind of comparison uh, with Aristotle. And uh, the word existence is, we don't have existence in Greek, okay? Something is or is not, okay? And there's excellent uh, work on it by Jean-François Coutine. So I, so the, the history, okay, the, the destiny of Uzia and its split into essence and existence in some interesting ways as a consequence of Christianity in particular. But um, so I'd be very, very careful to, in, in terms of trying to separate them in that sense, whether you separate them or not, in terms of substance, yeah, but substance is only something that is a determined at this, you cannot be pointed to it. Uh, <coughs> but you talk about the term, uh, if I'm going to try and think with you, um, I want to think in terms of modalities. You use the word determined, and I think you want the word determined. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you would not have possibility. You would have, in other words, a very reductive materialism. Um, yeah. I am a fenderless biped. I cannot grow wings, but that's a determinant. It doesn't, it doesn't determine, okay? So the question of possibility, I think, would be very important here in terms of both expression, especially expression and involvement and the dynamic relation between them. Do you care to comment on it a little bit? Um, yeah, so the question of possibility in, in the metaphysical uh, account that I'm trying to lay out is, um, is interesting, I think, because it relates to this question of, um, of what is the status of non-existing things, of things that could exist but don't. 
Uh, and I think that part of what my interpretation allows us to do, because what I was presenting here was all about the finite level um, of being. But I think we can account for existence and non-existence and, and possible existence um, if we if we think about it in terms of the existence of the infinite modes. So that's a, a much that's a much bigger uh, discussion. But basically, the idea that um, when you talk about something like the totality of, of space, the totality of uh, extended things, you have um, everything that everything that could be, everything that a thing could be, everything that's physically possible for a thing to be, that it may or may not be. And whether it is or is not is a function of the relationships, the modal relationships that are within that infinite mode. So if we're thinking about something, a spatial thing, um, in terms of a particular set of naturans and naturata, uh, as opposed to a much broader set, then we have different possibility. Um, we have different possibility descriptors that we're able to use. So if we think about the, to, um, if we think about the the atomic level, for example. Um, we don't see, we see possibility. Uh, we, see a, we see different ways that things could be organized together, could be said to be something um, that are more general than what we see on a, a more granular level. So that's where I would kind of locate possibility, I suppose. Um. I want to think in terms of the human, not the, the atom, because the ethics is still an ethics. Okay. What is, so what is possible for me ultimately, from our perspective, really should be addressed in some way there, uh, in terms of what is possible and what I'm not thinking about it in terms of, if you want to talk about determining the, the contradictory of the necessary is the impossible, not the possible. So the question is, how do we, how do you understand in Spinoza the relation between necessity and possibility, not necessity and impossibility? I'm trying to think of a way to uh, conceptualize this clearly. So, so I would say that on some level, um, the, the whole of nature is constituted by a kind of necessity, obviously. Um, and then possibility has to be, I guess I, I guess I would say that possibility has to be uh, predicated by what types of relationships we're looking at within nature. So something is possible um, with it. Po nature as a whole is necessary, but something is possible with respect to something else. Um, Thank you. That's, um, thank you, Bo. Uh, I'm going to move on the, the queue that's building up. We got Dan, uh, then Bunli, then Andrew. Well, thank you very much for that paper. That was fascinating. Um, and I want to, um, first of all, say that the, I guess what is most interesting is the idea of you trying to make sure we take Naturans and Naturata seriously in everything we encounter as, as it constantly being um, bombarded, if you will, by both. Um, I'm sort of reminded in a different context of the Kabbalah, where you have this notion of the Ein Sof, the, the without end, that is overarching the, uh, the Sephirot, the, 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 the lower, if you will, um, emanations uh, that constitute the way most people think of God. And there's so much in the Kabbalah said about these Sephirot and so little said about the Ein Sof, which is supposed to be most, most ultimate. And you're, I, I take what your project is, is trying to um, 
get past that and if you will take the and so seriously. Um, and so, and, and I love that. I, I, I don't know how much of, uh, whether I do enough of that. Um, there is one thing that I think confused me and, and, and probably because I'm trying to take notes and hear you at the same time. Um, and it had to do with when you were talking about essences uh, and specifically this singular human essence. And you were talking about the human being eating and laughing and singing and, and, and I thought I heard you say that those determinations express a singular human essence. Um, and that when it does, we associate that with naturans. Whereas when we think about the human body, which is obviously a, you know, in, in, in the attribute of extension only, then we're talking modally, then we're talking about naturata. I think most people, when they think about a human being, when they aren't necessarily saying a human body or the sum total of ideas in the human, human being's head, they're still thinking about the mode, if you will. And there's the mode of extension, which would be the body. There's the mode of thought, which would be the ideas of that body. Uh, but I, but I, I seem to be what hearing you, and I, and I may be wrong, and I'm, this is what I'm asking you, to be saying that, that, that naturans isn't just this power generator, but is this indivisible uh, space-time of essences. Um, can you speak to that, uh, whether I'm, I'm getting your, your meaning correct, and, and if not, uh, how I'm not? Sure, so I think it's um, a little weird one, because I spent, I spent most of this talking about the body, which is the realm of finite essences, obviously, but I began with naturans and naturata, which is the the um, the way that God relates to itself. And Spinoza um, explains that relationship of naturans and naturata on the level of God through these construct of the attributes and the modes. Um, and so, part of what I'm claiming is that if we kind of take naturans and naturata as a more general formulation, we can apply it to finite things as well. And that would be a relationship between modes, which, but I mean, in a sense, right? Because modes are themselves obviously what participates to some extent in God's power in naturans and what is to some extent determined in virtue of God's power, naturata. So um, we, when I talk about um, the body or uh, about uh, the kanatus as a kind of naturans, um, it, is, it is still a mode because it's finite. It's not, it's not the, uh, the, 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 total, the totality of power. It's power as it's expressed in a particular way. But if we want to understand how that power determines existence, that particular power, then we still need something like a naturata um, element to that relationship. And that would be the way that that finite power is powerful, is determinative on another mode. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Bonley. Oh, thank you. Am I? Yeah. Again, uh, I'd like to repeat what Dan said. Uh, it was a terrific, uh, terrific talk. Uh, I was particularly taken also by your discussion on Naturans and Naturata. Uh, I have a comment about though, uh, the use of finite and infinite. Um, okay. And it has to do because you were talking about Konatas uh, actually is more or less a mode. Um, the thing is that from the 17th century, from Newton, Leibniz, and Spinoza, when they were talking about infinite and finite, they were using those terms much more loosely than the physicists and the scientific establishment, the mathematical people would do now. 
Uh, for example, the universe we claim here, the model is that it's expanding. We're still not sure whether it's finite or whether it's an infinite universe, but it's constant, continually expanding so far, according to the model. There's a difference between infinite and unlimited. And I think most of the translations related and the use of the Latin in the 17th century really mean unlimited, not so much finite, infinite, because fi infinite in the modern physical sciences and math at least, uh, it's a very delicate little area <laughs> to deal with because you have to deal with whether things uh, converge, whether they diverge, whether they're continuous, whether they're dis discrete. And because you're talking about Natarata Natarans, uh, the, the coming into being, uh, that nature is, and God, are, in a sense, are both stable and changing all the time. Um, the, the way I would encapsulate that is to say, there's nothing contradictory. Co nature does not contradict itself. There's no contradiction in nature or in God. But that doesn't mean that men, humans, can't find what they think of as contradictions. But when you find contradictions, what you're really doing is it's the Natarans. Uh, it's because you can't establish Natarata. It's your model. Um, so anyway, I just think it, it would behoove us to be careful about using the terms finite and infinite uh, because you're really talking about limited or unlimited. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think that is definitely the case. And I think that that is, um, that kind of gets at an important thing that I'm trying to say, which is that, that you can establish something, you can take something as a particular Natsurans, um, at least when it comes to finite existence or you know, non, non divine existence, um, limited existence. Um, you can take something as a naturans partially, in so partially because of the way that it's limited to a particular domain about which you're talking. Um, so I can take the, uh, the, the human canatus as determinative at all of these different levels of existence, but it wouldn't really be a human, it'd be hard to, to say what it is unless I limit the scope to a particular naturata term. And so that, that's, that limitation is partially how they're co-constitutive, I would say. Hey, um, we keep moving and uh, we move to Andrew. Okay, I'll try to make it quick because I see Adit's back in the queue and Jeffrey. So I wanted to actually pick up on something that Adit brought out um, in the first part of her comment. So first, I really like the paper and I like how you frame your interjection of like expression and involvement into Spinoza. Um, and I like how you're saying that you want to, and I think rightfully, overcome some of the like, placing of one, you know, over the other, so like necessity possibility, et cetera. Um, but I guess I just wanted to invite you to say more about how you understand Aristotle on essence, because um, even like what Adit had said about substance being primarily the this, um, that's, that's primary substance. Secondary substance refers to like a genus concept, which I think is still relational. So I think there's a way in which we can read, or at least my reading of Aristotle is one of um, more relationality. So I guess, yeah, I just wanted to invite you to say more about why you chose Aristotle as a foil to Spinoza's view. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think I'll definitely take uh, Edith's advice on maybe refraining from, say, talking too much about Aristotle in the future. But uh, I, I thought, yeah, I thought it was a good, I thought it made sense as a foil. Um, and 
without knowing that Aristotle that deeply, I would, my, my impression was that, not that there isn't relationality in Aristotle or that relation isn't an important part of essence in Aristotle, but to just sort of, um, to show the radicality of Spinoza, where there's really no level on which you can say something isn't in virtue of something else. And I think that that's one thing that's really innovative uh, that I think is really fascinating about Spinoza. So that's kind of what I was wanting to get at with this. So, um, so yeah, I think that there's definitely, you know, there's definitely a relationality in Aristotle, though I take that point. Okay, um, we'll keep it moving. Edith, you would be next. Uh, are you interested in passing to Jeffrey uh, since to keep in the interest? Oh, you're muted. Since I already took a question or made a comment, let, let Jeffrey go back first and then I'll come in. Right, what I was suggesting. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I'd like a clarification. Um, the relationship, as you said, between Naturans and Naturata is, you said, deterministic. Now, do you really mean deterministic? That is it all or nothing, or is it partial? Uh, in, in modern physics that is uh, 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 post-Newtonian uh, physics, uh, we have probabilities. Um, photons going through a gate, for example, there's a probabilistic distribution of which photons uh, get through the gate and where they appear. Um, so are, are you saying it is all or nothing, or is there some probabilistic distribution of, of uh, the effects, if you will? Uh, I'm thinking um, of uh, quantum physics, but that's the way we need to think these days. I understand Spinoza was living in a Newtonian world, but how do we think about it? Thank you. Uh so one of the reasons, as I, as I kind of said in my conclusion, one of the reasons that I think both of these forms of essential relationship, expression and involvement are important um, is because reality as we see it is both necessarily determined, which is why for Spinoza, which which for, 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 sorry, which for Spinoza it has to be in order to be fully intelligible. You know, Spinoza wants to be able to say that everything that exists can be understood in terms of some necessity, because otherwise we would have um, occult properties. We would have things that are not explained. Um, so that's definitely the case. But at the same time, I think Spinoza doesn't want reality to be something that can be simply totalized or reduced to some kind of um, to some kind of mechanical system because everything expresses something everything results in something produces something um, so reality always is sort of moving forward um, resulting in more things um, you can't you don't you don't reach like a a, a ground where you can't go any further. You can always continue discovering more things, finding out different, seeing different ways in which things um, determine reality, or different ways in which reality is determined. So the, those are two essential characteristics of reality that we need to, or Spinoza needs to reconcile. Um, and I think that kind of leads to a bigger question, which is if you have involvement and expression as these two basic essential relations, like I described, um, how do you situate them relative to one another? Because in a way they almost seem to presuppose one another because um, if you say things follow 
things are expressed by a bunch of different essences. The only way that you have that expression taking place is by having those essences all together in some kind of system, um, in some kind of involvement relationship. And then alternatively, uh, you have an involvement relationship. You're trying, to, you're trying to articulate reality in terms of systems, but there's nothing to really motivate you to divide up the bigger system, the total system of reality and distinguish it in terms of different elements within it. So in order to do, in order to distinguish it, you sort of need something expressive. You need those things to have some expressive force always already in a way. So um, I don't know if that's clear, but basically I'm, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it's, it's something that I think for Spinoza has to be, it can't be answered simply yes or no. Um, reality is in a way free to produce, to express. God is a free cause, but reality is also um, never contingent in its behavior. And so reconciling those aspects of it, I think is sort of a bigger challenge. All right, all right. So we've come full circle back to Edith. Uh, the first thing is a comment. You have to make a, a, a distinction between the indefinite and the infinite. I mean, Spinoza, I mean, the letter on the infinite here is absolutely essential. And it's the only way you will be able to also bring it back together to the question of definitions. Definitions set a limit to inquiry. Okay, so the two, you can't read the letter on definitions without the letter on the infinite. But it's also there are two types of infinite and there are two types of definitions, not unimportant for you in particular, especially again here, I'm not talking about atoms. Uh, now, that will also help you explain or at least respond, not that you need to talk about the, the spherot and the ensof, but the ensof can be understood in, in Kabbalah. Uh, can be either the indeterminate or the or the or the, the indefinite and the definite. And it, we have it in the card, we have it everywhere, a distinction between the two. And Spinoza talks about infinite in kind, okay, which is the indefinite, and infinite in sur modo. Okay, I think that's absolutely essential for you if you're going to um, now, how do you establish a relation between dialectically? Okay, it's not, it's not an either or. I think you need more mediation, dialectical mediation here. Okay. Um, now, just a, a final comment in, one, in terms of uh, Jeffrey's uh, comment. Quantum does not falsify relativity, okay? They occur at two levels, and there's some very interesting work being done now, trying to really bring them together uh, into an account that doesn't say either either quantum or, um, or re re relativity. The two can be really brought together, again, not reduced to one another. The problem is our desire to simplify sometimes. Okay. In other words, it's not just undialectical, but it's sometimes really, uh, to quote another good friend of mine, false clarity is another name for myth. Uh, in other words, uh, sometimes, we need to complicate things dialectically rather than simplify them. But again, the indefinite here, I think is key for you. And the different, he never says, I mean, it's really important to think on the status of definitions. His definitions are never analytic. Analytic definitions are tautological. He not, doesn't say X is. X is said to be, or by X I understand. Back to my friend Aristotle. Telegatai, okay, or docaine. Believed to be something is believed to be, or something is said to be, not something is. Okay, unless we see that, we don't understand the law of non contradiction. We get to the reduction A is A only once we get to the car. And something can indeed be itself and not itself at the same time, but in a different respect. That's the difference between sameness, sameness and identity is huge here. And I think it's important for you to think those relations. Yeah, I definitely, um, 
I, I think that the comment about definition is really important um, because again, it, it speaks to that kind of relativity of things. Um, and that is something that it's tempting and kind of throughout the, my talk, I was, I was talking about it as if it were sort of a, um, a conceptual like mental choice. Like we have, we, we pick a particular index that we set in order to refer to a particular type of, uh, a particular existential field. Um, but the more challenging and I think more true thing is that that's how existence works for Spinoza. Everything is actually, um, you know, what a thing is, is that by which it is, which is something distinct from it, if, if, uh, if that makes sense. And also, um, Certainly, the dialectical idea is uh, is what I've been thinking about as as sort of the the way of um, of, of um, integrating this a little bit more fully about talking about the relationship between uh, expression and um, involvement as being a sort of a dialectical one. So, so thank you. All right, um, so we have five minutes. Uh, so if I, I don't see any other hands up, which means I will abuse my powers and ask a question myself. <clears throat> uh, in particular, I, I'm very stimulated by your way of trying to bring Bennett back in the conversation uh, because it's been, I don't know, at least 10 years uh, that the philosophical community has moved on uh, from several of his mistakes. Uh, in particular, I appreciate uh, the fact that you're trying to do it through Villanen, who's you know uh, a good friend, old Teddy. And um, so I'll, I'll come to the point, which is um, how would you resist the the main problem that both of them have, right? Uh, which is uh, the platonization of essences uh, and um, construction of essence as something different than existences, uh, which is only possible once you somehow separate actuality um, from, from um, formality, the formality of essences and the actuality of essences for Spinoza are coincidental. And um, I, I don't think it's impossible for you to do it. Uh, in fact, if, uh, I was surprised that there was very little said in your talk about your title, Aspect. And uh, there is very productive ways of using that notion uh, in this sense. But um, un until we do that work, I, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical or very afraid of taking seriously essences the way you're doing it. Uh, because it seems to establish like some kind of hyperuranium uh, that acts on, on matter somehow. Uh, so if, uh, if you can help me figure that out, that I would be very grateful. So, so I think that the reason that I want to take essences, um, I don't know, to make them a core part of this is that I don't want to just make Spinoza into, you know, like a, a reductive materialist. Um, and what was I going to say? I think the, the, the reason that I chose the expression and involvement relations, like these are two things that I think are very difficult to separate from essence itself. Um, it's hard to say, and that's sort of in the, the example that San Giacomo uh, that I quoted, where he's talking about the, the difference between the kanatus, which is what we typically refer to as the essence, and the power of the kanatus. Like these aren't really distinct things. They're um, they can be differentiated in terms of sort of the degree of coincidence that we're talking about, um, where there's this kernel of pure coincidence with the kanatus, and then this this larger field. Um, of influence, which is represented by different levels of coincidence. So I think that that, that for me at least, 
um, gives gives a sense of, you know, when I talk about essence, I'm not talking about a particular thing that is outside of existence somehow. I'm talking about a way that we could say that existence is related to itself because existence is this, this sort of fundamentally non-relational thing. Um, at least, you know, at most levels, it's non-relational. Obviously at the very most basic level, it is, it is the self-relation of God. Um, it is eternal. Um, but as we, we move into, we move into sort of finite being um, that becomes less evident. And so essence becomes something that is, is a little bit looser, is a little bit, uh, it, it's something that has, that, that shifts, that depending on what level, um, what type of being you're talking about, what you're, you're talking about a different type of relationship and therefore a different, uh, a different degree of essence, of essential intensity. Right. Um, so just, just to make sure that I'm not misunderstanding you, um, when you say that you don't want to fall back on reductive materialism, uh, and for this reason you're insisting on essences, uh, which part are you resisting? The reductivism or the materialism? Because, I mean, Spinoza is pretty clear that we have, essences are not ideal, right? Essences are not part of the realm of ideas. Or I mean, essences of ideas are, essences of bodies would not. Uh, and the existences of minds and existences of bodies are not uh, communicating. So uh, I understand that the, the project as, as, as being, uh, let's enrich existence, existential causation with essential causation, the way Voltaire does, right? Uh, in order to create, to stop the reductionism, but that doesn't stop the materialism, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the question of whether Spinoza, I don't know, I, I think to call Spinoza a materialist is not really. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's wrong, there's two attributes, yeah. at least, at the very least, infinite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I guess, so the reductive, I guess the reductive thing is what I, what I would, get away from to try to understand to the, the project for me i guess is trying to um how do you take an idea like spinoza's god and make it an actually useful account of how reality works and what i mean by how reality works is how existence tends to be how it tends to organize um and so I think that that's, that's the only way to do it is to try to, to think of existence as this kind of non-related plane and to have it, uh, have, have it be related to itself at all of these different sort of intersecting um, constructions. And depending on which construction you're, you're looking at, what kind of your frame of reference is, you're talking about um, God, or you're talking about uh, the infinite mode of um, extension, or you're talking about a table. Um, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you so much for indulging us and for your presentation. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for showing up and uh, for listening to us. Um, okay, so uh, we will have our next presentation in uh, two weeks. Uh, as usual, you will receive my updates uh, through our mailing list. If you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to be, uh, feel free to just email me. And in the meantime, uh, take care of yourselves and um, have a wonderful week.